to be a classical preparatory school, so I want to thank them for hosting us. And we've got a, uh, an all-star cast of folks here that are joining us. Uh, we have uh, Richard Corcoran, uh, Commissioner of Education, who many people around here know. Uh, we also have January Littlejohn, who's a parent from Leon County, who's going to speak. Erin uh, Lovely, who's also a parent from Palm Beach County, and she's going to speak. We have our Speaker of the House people around here know. Uh, we also have January Littlejohn, who's a parent from Leon County, who's going to speak. Erin uh, Lovely, who's also a parent from Palm Beach County, and she's going to speak. We have our Speaker of the House, Chris Sprouse, uh, from nearby. We have Senators uh, Kelly Stargell and Dennis Baxley, so I want to thank them for coming. We have Representative Joe Harding. We have Representative and future Senator Blaze Angolia. We have Representatives Byrd, Beltran, Grawl, uh, and Maggard. And not, last but not least, we have Senator Danny Burgess. So I want to thank all of them for coming here with us. So as many of you know, I think the last couple years have really revealed uh, to parents uh, that uh, they are being ignored increasingly across our country when it comes to their kids' education. Uh, we have seen uh, curriculum embedded uh, for very, very young children, uh, classroom materials about sexuality and woke gender ideology. We've seen libraries that have clearly inappropriate uh, pornographic materials for, for very young kids. Uh, and we've seen services that were given to students without the consent or even knowledge of their parents across the country. And we, unfortunately, that's happened here in the state of Florida. You're going to hear from some parents uh, where that has happened. Now, in Florida, we found at least six school districts that had policies regarding their child's well-being and to shield them from knowing about various forms of mental health services, Broward, Hillsborough, Miami-Dade, Palm Beach, Sarasota, and Volusia counties. Martin County also had a gender transition plan that can be implemented without the parents' consent. In Leon County, Florida, a school excluded parents from conversations about a student's, quote, gender transition, a situation for which the district superintendent has apologized for and admit that should never have occurred. And it's not just limited to Florida. In fact, it's probably a lot worse in many other parts of the country. In Idaho, a counselor was working with a 10-year-old student to help the student transition to a different gender without informing the child's parents. In California, a mother has filed a legal case alleging two middle school teachers manipulated her child's identity, then called the meeting to inform her, the parent, that the student is transgender. And in California, a high school student recently committed suicide after an L.A. high school gave her gender transitioning hormones rather than treat her underlying depression. And so we've also found cases where school districts and individual schools took it upon themselves to decide, decide it's okay to sexualize the education of very young children. We've actually have different uh, uh, things, and this is not something that I thought was something that was going to be around. So this is something that this is in Florida and other places school for very young kids the gender bread man. So this is trying to sow doubt about kids, about their gender identity. It's trying to say that, you know, they could be uh, whatever they want to be. Uh, this is inappropriate for kindergartners and first graders and second graders. Parents do not want this going on um, in their schools. What else do we have? Oh. This is, again, very young kids talking about when I, I was born, mom and dad said it's a girl, looked in the mirror, I saw a girl, kind of. Now I see a boy who has a transgender. So this is something that you're putting into classroom curriculum for five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old kids. And again, that is not something that's appropriate uh, for any place, but certainly uh, in the state of Florida. And shouldn't parents know if that is something that's in the curriculum, they should be able to have a voice in that. And so this is not just in Florida, and again, many other states, it's even more aggressive. In Connecticut, kindergarten students are taught about being transgender as part of, quote, social justice standards. In Denver, kindergartners were subject to, quote, gender sensitivity training, and in Illinois, they require sex education beginning in kindergarten. So this is part of a national trend to cut parents out 
of their child's education. In Florida, uh, we not only know that parents have a right to be involved, uh, we insist that parents have a right to be involved. And so we've already taken uh, great steps. Last year, I signed the Parents' Bill of Rights in the state of Florida, which was really something that was significant. Last week, we signed curriculum transparency legislation so that parents have a right to access the curriculum that's in their kids' schools, as well as understand what type of books are in school libraries. And today, we will sign HB 1557, the Parents' Rights in Education Bill. And this bill takes three main steps. First, the bill prohibits classroom instruction about sexuality or things like transgender in K through three classrooms. And after third grade, those curriculums need to be age appropriate. Second, the bill ensures that at the beginning of every school year, parents will be notified about health care services offered at the school with the right to decline any service offered. And finally, this bill ensures that whenever a questionnaire or health screening is given to our young students, parents receive it first and give permission uh, for the school to give it to their child. Now, there's been a lot of uh, uh, discussions about uh, this particular piece of legislation. You've seen a lot of sloganeering um, and fake narratives by leftist politicians, by activists, by corporate media, and you still see it even today after a lot of this stuff has been debunked. Now, it's true. Many of the people who help, who whip this up have never actually read the bill. Uh, they haven't taken the time to do that. They would rather just further narratives. Um, but I must tell you, these leftist politicians, corporate media outlets, some of these activist groups, they actually have read the bill. And they're sloganeering because they don't want to admit that they support a lot of the things that we're providing protections against. For example, they support sexualizing kids in kindergarten. They support injecting woke gender ideology into second grade classrooms. They support enabling schools to, quote, transition students to a, quote, different gender without the knowledge of the parent, much less without the parent's consent. And so what they're doing with these slogans and these narratives is they are trying to camouflage their true intentions. They know in every single poll that's been done that actually reads the language in the bill will find overwhelmingly Americans oppose injecting this type of material into the classroom of young kids. Americans support the right of parents to be informed and to be able to withhold consent over certain types of medical um, uh, treatments in, in school. So they know that, and so that's why they're resorting uh, to some of the narratives, and it hasn't worked but let's just be clear, it's not just all of them have not read the bill. Many have not. Many have, and many of them want to see this type of stuff in our schools. So be very, very careful when you see that. And I was, someone told me that there's even people in Hollywood that are, that are opposed um, you know, to, to, to providing protections for parents and enforcing parents' rights. You know, the one thing I'll say about that is if the people who held up degenerates like Harvey Weinstein up as exemplars and as heroes and as all that, if those are the types of people that are opposing us on parents' rights, I wear that like a badge of honor. <laughs> and so uh, we will continue to recognize that in the state of Florida, parents have a fundamental role in the education, health care, and well-being of their children. We will not move from that. I don't care what corporate media outlets say. I don't care what Hollywood says. I don't care what big corporations say. Here I stand. I'm not backing down. Uh, we will make sure that parents can send their kids to school to get an education, not an indoctrination.
And so I'm happy to be here today. We'll sign this in a minute, but in the meantime, we're going to have some speakers come up. And so the first speaker will be the Speaker of the House, Chris Sprouls. Thank you, Governor. It's great to be with you and all the members of the legislature that are here today. You know, there's a lot of nicknames when you have governors. You know, this governor has worked on education policies, worked on workforce, so much policy in the state of Florida. But I'm going to add another nickname. This is the boldest governor of America for Florida families, for Florida parents, and for Florida children. And I want you to think about that for a second, because I think all of this fits together. You know, a year and a half ago, when the rest of the country was shutting down schools, refusing to allow teachers back into the classroom to educate children, refusing to allow children to get back to education, this governor, Commissioner Corcoran, made sure that our kids not only got back in the classroom to learn, but made sure that before that, that this governor signed uh, Aaron Grawl, Representative Grawl's bill on the Parents' Bill of Rights to make sure parents knew these are the rights that you have as a parent. You don't give away your rights at the front door of the school. And that continued into this session. This is the session of Florida parents, of Florida families. You know, one of the upsides of COVID is that I don't think this ever before in our country have parents been more engaged in what their kids are learning inside the classroom and more sensitive to the books that are in the library, to the instruction that's happening and how that impacts their children. This session with this bill, uh, I have to give a, a, big, a big shout out to Representative Joe Harding, Senator Baxley, who all session long, all session long took the hits and the lies perpetrated in places like corporate media and Twitter and pushed back because they had one goal in mind, and that was to prevent little children, five and six-year-olds, from walking into a classroom and being indoctrinated on radical concepts like, like extreme gender ideology. So I want to thank both of you gentlemen for fighting that fight. But I think, it's, I think the governor's right. Like the, the fight is clear. Think about that, and I said this a hundred times during the course of the legislative session, the, the language in this bill is four pages long. It's double-spaced. <laughs> the changes are underlined, right? <laughs> if the teachers who had their kids redraft, you know, concepts that are here said, oh gosh, it's gonna be double-spaced and underlined, that's gonna make the day really easy. <laughs> this was super easy to figure out what this bill did. And yet, people lied about it. The media lied about it. Advocates lied about it. Whether it was in the White House press room or whether it was last night at the Oscars, there were lies about it. And the governor's right, they were intentional. Very few people tried to actually tell individuals what the bill did. I'm going to give Evan Donovan a shout out here because you did. You just you did a news and you said, this, this is what this bill does. Here's a graphic. Here are the bullet points. You didn't try to add personal commentary. You just said, you decide. But here's why people don't do that. Because if you tell Americans, you get to decide, do you think it is appropriate for kids to walk into a classroom when they are, I have a five and six year old, by the way, when they are five and six years old to learn about transgender instead of math or science or photosynthesis or, you know, whatever it is for that day, do you think that's appropriate? Maybe photosynthesis is a little intense for five year olds. <laughs> I hear Corcoran murmuring behind me. But the reality is they would, they would say, that's, that's crazy. Of course we wouldn't do that. And, and what have we seen? There have been outlets, conservative outlets, liberal outlets, moderate outlets who've released polls. Republicans, Democrats, and independents all agree that parents, parents should play an active role in these concepts. I, I couldn't be more proud um, of the individual legislators behind us. I am so grateful. I am so grateful that we have a governor in Ron DeSantis who is willing to say, I am going to push back against the lies. I don't care about Twitter. I don't care about the nonsense. We are going to lead in the, what's in the best interest of Florida parents and Florida children. It's great to be with you all today. Thank you. Okay, and so next, I mean, this is really what it's all about uh, to protect these parents. So first, we're going to hear from January Little John. Good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. My name is January Little John. I'm a licensed mental health counselor in the state of Florida and a stay-at-home mom to three incredible children. I want to first thank Representative Harding and Senator Baxley for sponsoring this bill. I want to thank all of the legislators who voted yes for this bill and stood up for parental rights and what's best for our children, many of whom are behind me, so thank you. 
And I want to also thank Governor DeSantis, who has been steadfast in both his leadership and his unwavering support for parental rights in our great state. What happened to our family is one of the many reasons this bill is necessary. In September of 2020, my daughter told me after school she had a meeting with school officials that was held behind closed doors where they asked her which restroom she wanted to use. I immediately contacted the school and was told by the guidance counselor and assistant principal that I could not be given any information regarding the meeting and that by law, my daughter had to be the one to authorize my notification of the meeting or attendance to the meeting. In other words, school officials asked my 13-year-old child her permission as to whether or not my parental rights would be honored. After many weeks of going back and forth with the district, we learned the middle school had created a transgender, gender non-conforming support plan with our 13-year-old daughter without our knowledge or consent. The plan was a six-page document completed with my daughter behind closed doors with three school officials that included the guidance counselor, the assistant principal, and a social worker I had never met. During the meeting, they asked her questions that could have significantly impacted her safety and her physical and emotional well-being, such as which restroom she preferred to use and which sex she preferred to room with on overnight field trips. The plan also directed school staff to use my daughter's birth name when speaking to us, her parents, and to use a different name in school with teachers, staff, and students. This plan directed school staff to conceal from us that this meeting and plan had ever taken place. When parents are excluded from critical decisions affecting their child's health and well-being at school, it sends the message to children that their parents' input and authority are no longer important. This created a huge wedge between our daughter and us because it sent the message that she needed to be protected from us, not by us. Social transition is a medical and mental health intervention that can lead to significant decisions that will impact the child's mental and physical well-being. Often social transition is the first step toward medical transition and schools are grossly unqualified to be taking these steps without parental involvement. Unfortunately, what happened to my family is not an isolated incident. I have been contacted by parents all over our state who's had their rights violated in the same manner. Parental involvement in a child's education is considered by many education experts to be the most important factor in student success. This is well known and documented, yet schools have been systematically cutting parents out of critical decisions being made with their children, painting them as enemies to their children with no due process. Parents know and love their children more than anyone in this world. I have always told my children my number one job is to keep them safe, and this school took that away from me. For the safety of our children, these parental rights violations must stop, and school districts must be held accountable when they break the law. Thank you, Governor, for signing this law. And just so you know, the left, they want that to happen to all other families. They don't want any protections for parents. They think that they should just be able to take your kid and do whatever with the hell they want with them. That is wrong, and she was right to stand up against the school district, and now every parent's going to have the right to do that. Okay, Aaron Lovely. Thank you, everyone, and thank you so much, Governor, for everything that you're doing and for honestly showing us what true leadership looks like. This is in everybody back here too, so thank you. Um, we're originally from Tennessee. I don't know if you can hear the slang. We're originally from Tennessee, but we moved to Florida eight years ago, and I could not be more proud to live in this state, honestly. So, you know, you never know how you're gonna feel about something, how you're going to react, what you're gonna do until it affects you or your family or your children, specifically, personally. And I never thought I would be a homeschool mom because I love to work, but here we are. Um, we moved to Palm Beach County from Orlando a year ago. We wanted private school, but due to thing, you know, because of things that we'd started hearing, but it wasn't in the cards for us financially. Um, everyone raved about Marsh Point Element Elementary. Everybody told us it was the very best school in our little area, and uh, so we went with it. A weekend, we lost the opt-out opportunity in, ma in ma masking 
a month in, a letter was sent home in my son's backpack, and I'm so glad I checked his bag. Um, it was on a Friday that three kids from each class were going to be selected and form a new class with, without our knowledge at all. There was no de details, no info whatsoever, no bio given, no meeting, no photo, and the parents aren't even allowed in, in the school. We were just supposed to be okay with, you know, sending our kid to a stranger. Um, he had already made friends, so we prayed hard over this and trusted God would take care of him. He always does, just not how you would think sometimes. I'm a positive thinker, so we just went. We just went with it. We quickly started hearing questionable things. Uh, parents were being called bullies because we were emailing her too much, and I'm like, we had a lot of questions, so yes, we were emailing her a lot. And my son's behavior started to change a little bit. Um, he was very frustrated with me, more so than normal. Um, later, other things came up, d disturbing things about medical choices that I think should be between the fa family. The kids were given extra credit if they made these medical choices. Um, second grade, mind you. Yes, but here's where I drew the line. Um, Thanksgiving morning, <laughs> he chose to tell me on Thanksgiving. We were sitting there and he tells me a, a book, about a book that she had read to the class called Call Me Max. It's this one here. Um, if you've read the book at all, uh, I could cry thinking about it. Um, there was no permission slip given, no heads up and, hey, how do you feel about this? Nothing. There was, a, there was somebody next door that gave a permission slip out to parents for James and the Giant Peach. And I'm like, what about, what about that one? Um, after she finished the book, so he had to sit there and listen to the whole thing. Um, after she finished the book, he raised his hand and he said, no, this isn't right. This is not who God made you to be. And uh, she disagreed with him and said, no, you can be whatever you want to be if you just have an imagination. And so I'm like, well, yeah, you know, you can be a doctor, a lawyer, president, <laughs> but God doesn't make mistakes, and he didn't make a mistake when he made you. Um, so under this, under this bill, which, again, obviously most people have not read it. I don't, I don't think a lot of people have. Um, it just it protects the fundamental rights of parents to make choices regarding the upbringing and the control of their chil children. It prohibits school districts from doing what happened in ours and prohibits classroom discussion about sexual orientation and gender identity in a second grade classroom. So needless to say, um, we never went back. We never went back to that class. He was moved to a third per person at this point. Um, we, had had, we had to switch him. I was like, he's not going back, but it was not an easy choice. It was not an easy process. The principal was not easy to work with in this. Um, but people have asked, why couldn't we have stayed in that class? And the simple answer is, when I talked to the principal about it, he said that these books, meaning there's more than just that one, are a district requirement to be in the public schools. So they have the choice to read them or not, but it's a district requirement. Um, so I was like, I just, I don't want him around that without the, the wherewithal, without the knowledge as a parent. This school and how they handle things uh, completely shattered my trust, and so I'm hoping with this new bill that things can change for all those sweet babies that aren't babies that aren't telling their parents, that aren't speaking up. Um, so I'm beyond thankful for the opportunity to be a homeschool mom. It's crazy, but I'm thankful, and I'm hoping that this can help for the for the parents that don't have the choice. So, thank you so much. Commissioner of Education, Richard Corcoran, where's he at? Thanks, Governor. I feel a little pressure speaking after these great speakers, and, and I don't have photosynthesis in my remarks, so <laughs> drop that bomb on me. But um, I think it's appropriate that we do this bill signing in a classical school. And if you look at what the classical model is, it goes back to the ancient Greek, um, and you talk about truth and goodness and beauty. And you're in a library, you know, where, you know, Mark Twain used to say, the person who doesn't read books has no advantage of those uh, that don't, are illiterate. Um, and if you look around the room, you see this just lined with great people throughout history, great thinkers, great philosophers, all in pursuit of truth. And what really is at stake, you've heard it from the governor, you've heard it from the speaker, you've heard it from these speakers, is it is a war on the existence of truth. What they're really trying to do, it's not just have debates and have people discuss whether you're on this side or that side, it is a war on whether truth really exists. 
And I also want to say at this point that how did I get to be the speaker when you bring in a bunch of cute kids? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm drawing some little small straws today. <laughs> one of them's mine. I won't tell you which one. She's over there. Can you stand for a sec? <laughs> oh, yeah. Is that your youngest? Yeah. But now that they're in the room, we've got this bill signed. I just want to close with this. You've heard it said many times. I've worked for this governor for four years almost. Um, and I will tell you, he's not a good governor. Um, he's not a great governor. He's the best governor ever. And you've, and you've heard it said from some of the speakers, there's just not a, I'll defy, I'll say it publicly, fact check me, do whatever you want. There's not a single study in the entire world that says when parents are actively involved in their child's education that outcomes don't increase. It does not exist. It is an absolute truth. And what every parent should know, every legislation we have done, every educational proposal we have fought for from the day this guy took office has been one single thing in mind, and that is we are going to do everything we can to help children get a world-class education, and we are going to protect parents and their right to make sure that happens for their child. So to every single child, to every single parent, know this, that this governor has your back, and he will not back down. Thank you, Governor. Okay. going to do it right here? Anybody? <laughs> now, did you plan that to get it when he spoke? Come on. Well, I think what you said is very important. It's what's, that's not on the page. That's not in the book. We're talking about classroom curriculum. Um, there are different uh, issues that will come up in the course. Kids will have questions on as they get older. I think, honestly, these kids probably aren't at that stage yet, uh, but as you do. Uh, and so it's focused on the type of curriculum that we've shown here, which is not appropriate for these young kids. And it also says all, all grades, it needs to be age appropriate, which I think most people agree with. And then the protections for parents so that they're involved in what is going on with their kids. And when you listen to January tell her story, about what they did with her, with her child without her knowledge or consent, uh, I don't think there's very many parents in the state of Florida that think that's okay. 
I can tell you, I don't think that's okay. First lady, you don't even want to know what she would say. So, so that's what it's about. It's about protecting parents' ability to be involved, and it's making sure that the classroom instruction, particularly at these very young age, are focused on math, science, and reading. And um, what's not on the page is not what's going to be done. We are uh, uh, textualists, so we follow the law. And I know Richard will make sure uh, that the Department of Education is going to follow the, the letter of the law. And that's how it should be. Yes, sir. Richard, you want to you talk about that? Because I know you guys in the school, bo school boards, and they have different. And if you look at the language, it allows us to. Like, yep. If you, if you read the last part of the bill, it gives the department um, to, once this bill is signed, now we can go and, whether it's the standards, whether it's the curriculum, whether it's the professional development, work it out so that people have that clear understanding. And I think if you talk to teachers, Jeff, you'll find that teachers are supportive of, they want guardrails. Where, where it's frustrating for a teacher is someone to say, hey, you're in trouble, you crossed the line, and nobody said the line was there. What this does is set clear guardrails, and, and I'll quote Justice O'Connor, you know, uh, I mean, age appropriate, I think people know what age appropriate is. Um, we wouldn't be here um, having this discussion if, if generally speaking, there, there wasn't a, a real issue or a real problem. I mean, they're, they're perfect examples. And so I think it's a, it's a great bill. It's a great opportunity for the department to make clear uh, guidelines and guardrails for the teachers, and I think the teachers will be happy with that. No, it, well, you, <laughs> what do you see happening? That, that was here in Palm Beach. I mean, that's, the, yeah. that's in found in Florida when you have the gender-bred man, and um, I think the Palm Beach, as you said, for second grade, they were saying it. And I think that's what a good point, Richard, with the teachers. People that go in to teach kindergarten do not want to be uh, teaching this as part of the curriculum. They want to focus on things that are core academic subjects and then obviously are age appropriate. I think the, the danger in how this has gotten in is not because most teachers want it to be. I think it's because these are directives from on high, from the bureaucracy or from very politicized members of school boards. And I think that's what we've seen across the country. So most teachers just want to teach. They're not getting involved with, with very young kids to try to pursue um, some type of ideological agenda. They just want to do it. And, and that's I, so I think in some ways it's a parent's protection, but I also think it's a teacher pr protection, because now teachers will be protected against someone from on high, whether in a bureaucracy or in a school board, telling them that they need to do gender bread man, or telling them that they need to talk about things like transgender to a first or second grader. Um, let's focus on the core academic subjects. Those issues, particularly for that age, you know, that's something that parents can discuss or not as they deem appropriate, but that is not the right of a school district to supersede the parents' rights um, and inject things that the parents don't think are appropriate at those ages. Governor, what's the biggest misconception that you're hearing people talk about this bill that bothers you the most? Well, honestly, I mean, I think it's just the fact that, um, you know, they tried to sloganeer, they tried to create things that were not in the legislation, um, which that's politics. I mean, that's what happens. Uh, but they're doing it, I think many of these leftist politicians, they're doing it because they actually support having woke gender ideology in first grade. They support how January was treated by the school system there. They don't think parents should know. They think you should be able to have a school district that will gender transition somebody without even telling the parents or giving them the consent. So they've got to figure out a way to camouflage that policy position because that is not a policy position that is going to be terribly popular. So I think that they've gone through sloganeering and all these things really out of desperation because they know they could never argue their position on the merits. They would have to, uh, they would crumble, I think, under the weight of, uh, of outrage from parents if they were actually standing on the wall and saying that they support those things. And what I just say is, look, you know, stand up and say what you're for. Okay? If what you're for is good, you should be willing to stand up there and sing it to the heavens and let the chips fall where they may. The fact that you don't, the fact that you're trying to concoct narratives and manufacture this stuff, you know, that just shows me that you know you're taking positions that are totally untenable. And so um, I'm not surprised. The funny thing was, was like, I mean, I think, Evan, you were on the first to ask me. I just started getting asked about it. I wasn't even following how they're doing the language and all this. And I start hearing these slogans, and I'm like, okay, I know it's BS, right? 
I don't know what is exactly what exactly they wrote. I just know this is BS. I can sniff this a mile away. So then when I went back and read what, what the, like, kind of the language was that they were debating, um, and it says, you know, no classroom instruction on sexuality or gender identity for grades K through three, I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Are they honestly going to go? Is this the hill they want to die on? And I understand they had dressed it up differently, but I was like, there is no way that that is something. But I think it was just, it was out of desperation because they knew they couldn't defend it on the merits, and so they had to do it. The good thing is, is, you know, people reject these narratives nowadays because they know so many of them are false. And so what are they trying to tell you? Why are they doing that? Who's doing that? And when it's the usual suspects, I think the majority of people in Florida, they just, they chalk it up to, you know, that's just business, you know, usual suspects, we're not worried about it. Um, but look, at the end of the day, stand up and say what you're for. If you want, if you think January should have been treated that way, then stand up and make that case. Um, I don't think very many people think that. If you think that someone, a, a Florida parent sending their kid to first grade should have the gender bread man in there talking about being a different gender as for a six-year-old kid or seven-year-old kid, um, say that and try to make the case for it. But just be honest about where you're coming from on all this. And so uh, I just want to thank you guys for coming. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we appreciate what you're doing. Thanks, everybody. God bless. You're watching the Florida Channel, connecting Florida. Sitting among trees, flowers, and fountains in Eden Garden State Park is a renovated two-story house with white columns and a wraparound porch. The estate is located in the city of Point Washington and was built in 1895 by the Wellesleys, a wealthy Florida timber family. In 1963, Lois Genevieve Maxson bought and renovated the home, as well as planted the gardens which enhanced the natural setting. The restoration fulfills a local legend that claims the original design was inspired by an antebellum plantation house where the builder was given shelter on his